this is going to be a Melbourne talk and we were chatting on the phone yesterday and realised that our perspectives are profoundly shaped by where we grew up. I'm a Melbourne girl, Melbourne eastern suburbs, Box Hill, so I was born in the Bethesda but I grew up in Bocky um, and that was fairly working class. I mean it was uh, people, people in the street were working class, upper working class, skilled workers, a few families that were really struggling. Um, what was difficult about our, our street and, and our family there was that ours was the only rubbish tin, remember they used to be made of metal, that had an ominous clink from alcohol bottles um, because no one drank. Uh, this was a, 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 a a non-alcohol non area, everybody went to church, everybody went to Sunday school, and my parents were very different sort of people. And for being left wing, which is what they were in the 50s, was pretty scary, uh, where they felt, uh, certainly my father felt very insecure in his job because of his history, uh, their interests their, and, and what they read and the books they had in the house uh, were completely different from everyone else. So we grew up as a completely alien and sort of environment. And so going to Sydney, where we had you know, occasionally went to visit some family friends, Sydney for the next 20 years was always a marvel because it was so labour. And you had labour funerals. <laughs> um, you had wonderful schools which were built by the government whereas we'd had a few old big red brick ones like the one I went to but all the schools that were being built in the 50s were sort of like uh, air force camps you know I mean they were temporary buildings they were freezing they were hot in summer they were totally inappropriate for education uh, but Sydney had all these wonderful buildings and schools and all these things that happened and there were free tickets for people who were at school to go on the railway and a slew of things that didn't happen in Victoria. And if we're to understand a lot of the key differences between the parts of Australia, it goes right back to the 19th century and to the very different ways each of the colonies was populated. And Tasmania and New South Wales and a bit of Queensland obviously had a significant convict population, although convicts weren't awfully productive of next generations, which is one of the things we've discovered in the research I've been doing. Um, but what's really critical, and particularly for Queensland, is that Queensland's population before the Second World War was almost entirely built by subsidised migration which means, yes, they're people with skills, but they're people entirely without capital. Now, Victoria, as its population was, was grew in really through the gold rush, and one of the characteristics of that was that nearly everyone who came here paid their own way. So it was populated with people who were educated and had money. Even the Irish who came had to have money to get this far. So the Irish who came to Australia were quite different from those who went to America. Uh, South Australia similarly was planned migration of largely Protestants uh, and of course the Germans. Um, but what's important is that for a period Melbourne in the 1850s and 60s was the most literate place in the British Empire. Now it gave us a tradition of progressive politics. The Chartists actually made their mark here Eureka is really about Chartism rather than it is about any sort of Irish nationalism. That's one of the myths we've had. But the character of Victoria is formed in that period in the 19th century. So we've had liberalism, and, and Stuart McIntyre has written very well about this, and we had a very radical left, which was Protestant. And then Archbishop Mannix wrecked it all. <laughs> <laughs> But certainly Victoria by the 1950s, uh, where fear of communism was intense, if you had been on the left, you were very insecure and nervous, you didn't talk about politics, you didn't say anything about, you didn't even say, I was encouraged not even to say my parents voted Labor. Uh, and that was the atmosphere that we grew up in anyway. So my remarks are tonight directed at from a Melbourne perspective in many respects, um, but I want to talk about feelings. Now, tackling inequality is not a trivial political ambition. 
Inequality is the most deeply resistant social and economic phenomenon of all. And it's been the aspiration of virtually all radical reforming movements, and they've nearly all failed. Piketty has shown us how the inexorable drive of capitalism, when uninterrupted by global catastrophe or unrestrained by regulation, is for financialized wealth to grow virtually exponentially, while wealth from productive work, to follow Malthus, can only grow arithmetically. The world, as with unconstrained population growth, that is if you don't have too much death, cannot maintain its supplies and amenity. The excessive growth of wealth at the top drains the rest of the economy, growth slows, wages stagnate, and living standards fall, which is what we have currently. Yet paradoxically, liberal democracies should have the numbers to constrain the few at the top, particularly as they become fewer. And yet they fail to convince voters that it's not in their best interests to support tax cuts for big corporations and the wealthy. Instead, Malthus again, inequality has only ever been reduced, certainly in the 20th century, by what Malthus would have called positive checks, that is death and disaster, rather than precautionary checks. Ali Hothschild's latest book, Strangers in Their Own Land, captures the deep story of Louisiana whites who are God, good, God-fearing people, who work really hard, who keep all the rules, who believe in the promised land on earth as well as in heaven. And that promised land, of course, is the American dream. Yet for decades, living amidst an unbelievably toxic landscape, which is poisoned from meters below the earth to into the sky, through all their forests, all their bayou, everything is absolutely toxic in these areas from petrochemical industry. They live in this, this devastated landscape, yet they feel they've been standing still. They've been doing all the right things, but they're getting nowhere. And somehow there's all these people now beginning to get ahead of them, cut in ahead of them in the line. Black people women, Hispanics, uh, people who, who've gone, black people have gone to a good university. They say, how can Obama and his wife have got to Harvard and Princeton? It's not right, it's not something, something rotten has happened. Um, liberals from the North. Government and regulation, however, are not the enemy. Sorry, are the, are the enemy, not the corporations and the politicians who do their bidding. So they hate the, the Environmental Protection Agency even while they're dying from cancer breathed in in their environment. They can't blame unbridled capitalism because all their hopes, everything they believe in for the American dream, are in fact invested in it. If you damage capitalism, wealth will disappear and their hopes are gone. Because one day, one day, like Willie Sloman, they're going to get on the, the ladder, they're going to get there, they're going to take their steps. So this is what Ali Hoshield calls their deep story and their profound sense of loss and grievance. They're being left behind as they feel in that mighty state, the mighty state of Queensland. I have Queensland relatives who always talk about mighty Queensland and you know, uh, Kevin Rudd was on the money when he told George Bush that Queensland was bigger than Texas. Um, or they feel this in regional Tasmania, or increasingly in deindustrialising communities in Adelaide, Melbourne and Sydney. And they're absolutely right. The Australian dream of a home and a garden is now beyond their children. The Australian entitlement to a decent, secure job for those even with skills is a thing of the past. If you're a young school leaver, over 55, semi or unskilled, disabled, you're not likely to get a job at all. Now employers want to bring back junior wages, but just as happened before World War II, that used to mean that only juniors got jobs, preferably girls of 14 or younger, and once they reached 18, they were sacked. Poor Australians have no illusions that Australia is a classless society. That's a conceit of the rich. They know the odds are stacked against them from the beginning, but Australians generally hate unfairness. They believe, they say, in the fair go, yet they find it almost impossible to accept a class analysis of our social condition that explains why, who doesn't get a fair go and why. 
If we're to reinstate class in our politics, how do we deal with the reluctance of Australians to identify now with being working class? I think we've moved a long way from the world that Tony's talking about, and this is very much, again, a Melbourne world. Those who tend to think of themselves as working class tend to be Labor people, but they're not with the majority. Most Australians' deep story will not, permit it to see, will, not, will not permit them to see their lives in such class terms because they're as good as anyone else. They can make it themselves one day. Their time will come. Labor is always talking about bad stuff. Remind, sorry, um, that it's ha bad stuff that has happened is happening now and might happen in the future, while the right offers dreams of betterment. Compare the harsh wine of La with poor old Artie Corwell uh, in, in Labor in the 1950s and 60s, reminding people of the dangers of the Depression, while Menzies' dulcet tones spoke to their suburban dreams. If class analysis is central to understanding society, which I believe it is, this is not a narrative that resonates with people who want a narrative of hope and grief and progress. Above all, Richard, what Richard Wilkinson calls the hidden injuries of class mean, and this is sensitive, but it means that most people's lived experience of being working class is of having been made to feel inferior. And you can't build a broad politics by descending into except by descending into racist populism and finding people you can feel superior to. I mean, I think this is what hit me so many years ago doing <coughs> Struggle Town in Richmond, of people saying really about being working class was that they were made to feel inferior and that this feeling of inferiority, they were looked down on and so on, and that's, that's still the case. Historians used to agonise over the archives to find the moment when class happened when previously unorganised, atomised people recognised that they had a common plight and a common enemy. The great work of Georges Lefebvre, The Coming of the French Revolution, traced how the peasants had to make a big mental leap from seeing their immediate enemies as their next door neighbours who shot, came out in the darkness of the night and moved the stones to increase their plot of land, to seeing their enemy as being that they had com a common enemy and their enemy was the landlord, and the next step was to see the landlord as one of many landlords. And that is a very big psychological step, a very difficult one for people to take. E.P. Thompson, the Labor historian, argued that class is a relationship, and this was a very helpful uh, tr uh, m uh, idea for, tr for the left. But that's a, it has to be felt, a relationship that needs to be felt, acknowledged and understood. Now we live in a much more complex social world where people's public relations are, ships are, me are mediated by social media, celebrity, film, television, marketing, etc. They may deplore huge corporations, but unless you're a farmer in the grip of Monsanto, these objects of hate are remote and symbolic. I mean, Gina Reinhardt is widely deplored, but she's, and it's just individualised, but she's untouchable. She's not part of our actual politics for all of us. Richard Wilkinson, again, has argued that the poorer and more excluded you are, the more unrealistic become your ambitions. 15-year-old black American boys dream of stardom and Hollywood and celebrity. Their Swedish contemporaries are able to envisage being a carpenter because there is less shame in being a carpenter in Sweden. I remember even just the finishing class of my son at uni high, uh, that what they want, they all wanted to be rich and famous. Uh, young people's dreams are completely out of touch with what they really can achieve. And I think we're seeing a big increase in depression amongst university students uh, who are beginning to realise they've got all this debt, they're getting all these degrees, and their chances of a career are getting slimmer and slimmer. Deep stories like these are in fact not really rooted in social and economic or even political reality. They are in fact antidotes to pain and frustration and we can't reach into those lives unless we talk about that pain and even more importantly deliver 
and, and which things which speak to those fears and hurts while leaving people's sense of self and hopes intact. So the narrative needs to be about fairness, but it also needs to be about security because it's insecurity that drives people to accumulate beyond what they actually need, particularly in property, to maximise their wealth by avoiding tax and developing things like family trust. As housing becomes unaffordable, we are in fact returning to the 19th century where most people had no property. They were landless. And therefore they can depend only on the goodwill of the community, which they did through charity, uh, or on their own earning capacity or on their family. And as we witness the rise of the precariat, those trapped in precarious work without effective regulation or union protection, insecurity is now mounting the class ladder. It is even now dragging down those who believe themselves immune because of education and connections and for whom a professional career that improves an income and prestige over time is now a distant prospect. It is enveloping even those who went to expensive good schools and we need a narrative that will cross the class barriers between middle and working class. So in fact the terms class are going to have to be rethought or it's, we only have to have a quite different narrative. So how do we link security and to fairness and reduce the temptations to look after one's own at the expense of others? We do, I think, need to talk about human rights at work, at school, in the community. We need to demonstrate that rules and regulations around work and business protect the majority, as do health regulations protect us against infectious disease and food poisoning. It is the same sort of thing. We need to defend and promote unions and cooperatives as the front rank defenders of people who depend entirely on their income earned from work. We need to frame tax-funded tax health care as collective health insurance. We don't use the word insurance in this country. They do in the UK, and they'd used it after the Beveridge Report. We don't talk about insurance, and people don't mind paying a lifetime of insurance to protect their house against fire. They don't lie on their deathbed and think of all the money they've wasted uh, because the house never burnt down. Uh, but it's the same with health care. Lucky you if you reach 80, 95 and you've not had a big time in hospital, um, and that's great. But had you needed that, had you had a terrible car accident, that hospital is there. We need to frame tax-funded health care as collective health insurance and to regulate the profits from private consultants and insurance companies. We need to interrupt the inter intergenerational transfer of excessive wealth and privilege by using inheritance taxes. We need to instruct transferable superannuation and linked income insurance to tide people over between jobs. Even tradesmen can't afford income insurance. The electrician who worked on our re building recently, he only can function because his wife's in a salaried job. We need to reconstruct, finally, our education system to serve a democracy rather than an inherited meritocracy. There are two great engine houses of private inequality in Australian society. Inherited wealth, obviously, especially in property. And secondly, caste, as conferred by education. Since the beginning of white settlement, particularly in Victoria, European Australians have been jockeying for social standing, investing heavily in means of distinction, to this day spending a quarter of a million dollars on secondary education that should guarantee lifelong membership of a superior caste, and if you're going to want to do it for the full 13 years, it's half a million dollars spent on getting a child through a good school. Uh, I use the term caste advisedly because, as in India, this is the other edge of the class sword. Uh, the endowment of superiority and an entitlement to superiority that goes beyond money. You can lose your money once, once you have caste membership, you can lose your money 
but you rarely lose your caste distinctiveness unless you behave very badly, become an alcoholic, for instance. And that comes with it is a sense of entitlement and an entitlement to influence and significance. In the 1930s, Melbourne's depleted and struggling middle class could buy their son's caste membership for life with just 50 pounds, which might be left to them by grandma, to fund a year at Scotch College, including uniform and books. That's all that was needed, and an awful lot of families did that. Just one year at Scotch, and for the rest of his life, that boy would say, of course, I was at Scotch. But he actually spent most of his schooling at St Kilda State School. And this would transform the boys' life chances, even though government at the schools at that time were academically better than private schools. Having been at Scotch, of course, which is how you say it, um, you got a job in a larger insurance company than if you had only been to Trinity Grammar, let alone Melbourne High School. Caste still matters, and state schoolers still smart at being state schoolers, and if successful themselves, fork out for their children to attend private schools, often declaring they know they're going against their socialist principles, but you can't be, you've got to think of your children's life chances. Unlike Sydney, where money could be brash, the Melbourne middle class has been subdued and shamed by the 1890s depression. They compensated through private schools, creating what could be called a moral middle class, whose right to rule derived from their superior moral training, if not academic schooling, in a church school. This is a caste and it is with us still, even if it is now wilting in the Liberal Party under the rise of the religious right and the children of European migrants with a very different historical baggage. The moral middle class, I would suggest, is right material for the Greens as they move forever rightward, and I would suggest they target uh, Ku Yong and Higgins. <laughs> because that moral middle class had some very good liberal values. They are small L liberals in many things. They, you know, they, didn't, they deplored Henry Bolte and hanging. They support asylum seekers. They are very concerned about the environment. It's just that they can't move to the other tribe because of their whole sense of self. But so they're right for the Greens. The Greens should move there. Australia has the most unequal and therefore inefficient school education in system in the whole OECD. And that inequality has been massively funded and extended by government since 1964. If state aid to church schools had only been for Catholic systemic schools, which I think it was necessary, many private schools would have gone by the wayside and closed. Private girls' schools in particular at that time were academically very poor, especially in science and mathematics. To me, it is outrageous that some of them, once tiny, dreadful ladies' academies, now boast ATARs with 50% of their students above 90 and 12% above 99. This is biologically impossible unless they have been actually uh, indulging in severe culling or fraud. <laughs> But as J.K. Galbraith said, of humans presented with the opportunity of becoming rich without doing any work, they become completely irrational. So as parents, we become quite antisocial when it comes to the life chances of our own children. Here, effective liberal democracies have to step in to divert this self-interest, as democracy can only flourish where the state provides schooling that embraces all children in a common shared enterprise. Canadians have done this better than we have, though not in Quebec, um, and most European countries likewise, though the Swedes have recently undermined their system with semi-privatisation. Now that high mortgages have put private schools become the means of many of the younger middle class, we are seeing a trend back to government secondary schools, and guess what? You would no believe it, they're no longer perceived to be sinkholes of underachievement. If we abolish funding to independent schools and spare Catholic systemic schools, make sure that the church distributes the money properly and those with very low fees, we can quietly await the implosion of the private school sector in this country and the increasing irrelevance of the, of the whole sector. It's not dissimilar, I suggest, to awaiting the inevitable demise of coal-fired electricity. 
What our unequal school system does for us is to entrench inequality from early life. Even worse, the evidence is clear that exposure in utero, even before birth, and infancy onwards to domestic violence, acute parental stress, emotional and physical neglect, harm cognitive development, and produces lifelong intellectual and social disabilities. Children who grow up in those environments are up to three years behind by the time they reach four. At, the, at a less extreme level, young children fall between the cracks of unhappy and insecure households and poor quality childcare and preschool education. Yet we entrust these critical early years to the private sector and the Turnbull government is just about to cut further funding for national four-year-old kindergarten. Generous investment in maternal and child health nursing, not rationing visits to 12 per baby as at present, we haven't changed that from the Kennedy era, high quality intervention for parents' mental health, high quality care and therapy for children in all childcare settings, coordinated family interventions that help everyone, and of course proper kindergarten for the three years of, from three years of age. All of these are cheap investments compared to the cost of lifelong personal misery, mental ill health, and costs of possible incarceration. This is not rocket science. Indeed, Dr. Vera Scantlebury Brown established such an integrated system of maternal and child health centres, public creches and kindergartens in Melbourne in the 1920s, and it made a critical difference to child health and welfare during the Great Depression in the inner city. Currently in Doveton, an integrated one-stop shop being supported by private charity is offering in the school adult education, health care, child care and, and leisure and has been in their local primary school. The impact is already transformative. The narrative around all of this has to be fairness, democracy and freedom from fear, anxiety and insecurity. It should be a narrative which is what Labor's mission, I think, is of institutionalised fairness, which starts with the common law, workplace relations and legal entitlements. <coughs> it needs to be about insurance uh, for health, old age and disability. It might even, in a strange way, have to be around patriotism. The love of one's country and its people, provided that remains inclusive of newcomers and does not privilege the Pauline Hanson generation. It's embarrassing to hear Africans in Melbourne saying that Australia is the country of the fair go when it pat so patently isn't and they are doing it so tough. To the extent that women have told a local MP's office, why did you bring us here? It's too hard. We'd have been better off if we'd stayed in the camp in Kenya. We need to start talking about safety, <coughs> and security, insurance in cooperation, insurance and mutual help. The old Victorian working class values that the gold rush and, and brought to Victoria and South Australia. We have never been egalitarian in this country. That is a myth. Even the bulletin was a thing, was a journal written by city bohemians who hated the bush and were far from egalitarian. And tell that talk from the beginning about trouble with Australians that, oh, that, you know, Jack is as good as his master. Who was saying it? Well, it was usually gentlefolk who were discomforted by ordinary people's manners, being unaccustomed to mixing with such people in the old country. It really was all an illusion, much championed by middle-class left-wing romantic historians like Russell Ward. In colonial Melbourne, people were rushing around, leaving visiting cards, manufacturing lineages and connections in the hope that 12,000 miles distance would not would sa save them from being exposed, and quite often they didn't. And we haven't stopped as we compare house renovations, overseas selfies, children's achievements, and, and comparing and, and playing these games. Except that inequality makes people sick. The data is there. It poisons relationships, the data is there. It diminishes productivity, the data is there. It sours social relationships and in the end, it actually kills people. Thanks.